Our scripture today is found in the book of Exodus. Not too often we get to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and for this chance to be in your word. You have not allowed us to bump through the dark, but have given us a a path to walk upon. You have led and guided us, and you've done so through your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit is with us as we read this together, and that the words that are expounded upon it, Lord, we pray, are blessed by you, and that you use them to touch our hearts that we may draw closer together. We thank you, Lord, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. Hear now God's word. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household, If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed to, in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, the same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, it will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Passover is such an extremely neat celebration uh, by the the Jewish people. If you ever have a chance to take part in the Passover meal, um, please do so. It's it's quite, quite the experience. Now, to fully appreciate Passover, we've got to kind of Understand, and I think many of you do understand uh, just where this scripture is coming from and what's going on during this, this this time. So let's go back about I don't know 500 years or so from the time that this scripture was written, and we see Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his his brothers to eat, eat Egypt. And while Joseph was there, God used Joseph in order to feed not only the nation but the modern world in that area uh, during a seven-year famine. Now, Joseph's family, uh, his father Israel, and the 12 sons, 11 sons, and and their families needed a place to stay during this famine. So Joseph uh, bargained with with Pharaoh, and they gave them a a land, Goshen, I think it, it was called. And they were all able to live there uh, just on the outskirts of, of um, e- e- Egypt. Now, time passed. That Pharaoh who was favorable to Israel, to the people of Israel, um, had died. Israel stayed there and, and uh, lived and grew and became a mighty people. Um, many, many people. 
and the, the Pharaoh at the time was afraid and so put them into slavery, where they remained in slavery for about 400 years. Now, that's a long time to be in slavery. And when a people is in slavery for that long, um, you start to get used to the idea of being slaves. Never liking it, always wanting it to end, but it becomes a norm. And so they were crying out for, for freedom during the time of Moses, and, and I'm sure well, well before that. I'm not sure if they ever expected it to happen, but Moses heard, or God heard their cries and sent Moses to help, help them and his brother Aaron. So many plagues went through Egypt, and so many times that they were promised to be let go, and then the promise was take, take, taken away. And then finally, this final plague. And Moses sent them, or God sent them, this scripture that we just read to, to, today, to what to do to prepare for this final plague. And in doing so, they had to prepare for themselves a feast. This feast was to be a reminder for all generations from this point on about what God did did for them for Egypt in bringing them out of slavery. Now, I love the the particulars of the feast. One thing about this feast is that everyone is supposed to enjoy it. But there's an understanding or recognition that not everyone can afford food. But that was to be no excuse. Moses said, well, God said through Moses, share. If there's a household around you who can't afford a lamb, buy a lamb big enough for everyone. Invite them over. And I love that about Israel and this community. <coughs> and I pray that our community is the same way. I know our community is the same, same way. If someone can't, can't be a part of the celebration for one reason or another, we always find ways to provide for them so that they can join in the celebration because one thing the Passover feast reminds us is that it's not about me. It's about what God has done for all of us. And so as they prepare this this uh, lamb in very specific ways, they're supposed to gather together, and this is a beautiful scripture. They said, this is how you're supposed to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Now, this is a remarkable scripture, because again, remember, they have been slaves for over 400 years. They're not allowed to go anywhere. They're, they're, uh, what they do on a day-to-day basis is dictated to them. They have no choice in the matter, and they have to do what they're told or be punished severely because of it. And in the past, what, nine plagues? Pharaoh told them they could go and in some way have some minor amount of freedom and then even snatch that away. Sitting with the rope, with the cloak tucked into the belt and the sandals on your feet and the staff in your hand was a sign of faith in, in, in God. Honestly, I don't think it's a very comfortable way to eat dinner holding a staff in one hand and eating the lamb in the other, having your cloak tucked in. I know when I'm in eating dinner, I have to undo my belt. So keeping your belt on and, cl- and having your, your cloak tucked in seems uncomfortable, but again, it's a sign of faith. It's a sign saying that God will free us and that this celebration is a celebration of that freedom. What's remarkable of the celebration of the freedom is that freedom hasn't come yet. It's a hopeful dinner. It's a meal full of hope and trust in God who said, I will free you. And so in eating the way that they are, they said, yes, Lord, we know. We know you will. And so we are ready. after the Passover had happened and they were free and they became a nation themselves, they ate their meal in freedom every year to remember what God had done, that, done for them in Egypt. But do you know how they ate? 
They ate lounging in a chair. Uh, not just any chair, but cushions, lounging at a, a table. Because servants, when they eat, they eat standing up. They eat ready because they may not be able to feel their, finish their meal because the master might need them for anything at any time. So when you eat, you stand so that you're ready. But they ate as free people, lounging. And not just them, but everyone. Every, every um, level of their economic society ate the Passover lounging. Because of what God had done for them, God had made them free and made them a nation. Now the story is not over. That's the beautiful thing about Passover. Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples and, and they were celebrating Passover. And during that meal, Jesus <coughs> started communion for his church, for us. Communion is in some ways our Passover. And what they celebrated and what they commemorated in the freedom of what Passover represented, communion represents that same thing. You see, everyone who's here worshiping, or uh, maybe not everyone, but some of you who are here worshiping together, some of us are in bondage. Some of us have chains around us, some of which maybe people don't know about, some of which maybe people do. We're not always as free as what we want to, to be sometimes. But through communion, we're reminded that the love of Jesus Christ and what he has given to us has given us freedom. Has broken those bonds that surround us. And maybe they're not broken yet. Maybe we're still struggling with whatever it is. Maybe we have fear or anxiety or there's something else chaining us down. The communion reminds us that through Jesus Christ, we are free. That we're not alone. That we are loved, whoever and wherever we are. And that there's nothing in this world that can happen that can take away that freedom that Christ has given to us. I think I mentioned this last week, but it it seems to fit again this week. There's a scripture in, uh, in Acts about Paul and Silas who are in prison and they're put in chains and they're praying to God and singing and worshiping. And at midnight, and the chains are broken, and the doors fly open, and nobody leaves. They all stay in prison, because leaving would hurt the jailer and his family. And besides, they didn't have to leave, because through Jesus Christ, I believe they all realized they were free already. And no amount of bars or chains can take that away. We're celebrating a weird holiday tomorrow. Out of all the holidays, I think this holiday is the biggest lie. We call it Labor Day. But really, it's the only day in our lives that we try not to labor. So I'm not sure why it's called that. I think it should be called Laborless Day. But we're given freedom, and we're reminded of the freedom that we have. But as is said quite often, with the freedom that we have, responsibility is also there. Because of what Christ has given to us and what we're about to celebrate through communion, I pray that we use that freedom for the glory of God. That we give thanks for what we have and we share it freely with others as Christ or as God asked of of the Israelites. We give of ourselves freely and joyfully as Christ has given us of himself.